All right, so that is Caesar's Palace. That's the Rio. That's uh, Palms, I think. And that is where we're trying to go right now. Welcome back to the channel guys. This is day three of my Vegas vacation. And here is the final stop, the Orleans, which some of you might not have heard of, but they have poker and actually quite a lot of it considering that it's an off strip property. So without wasting any more time, I'm gonna jump in there and play some two five. From what I gathered, it's eight handed with plexiglass dividers. So sounds like a decent time to me. It seems like they're gonna open the first two five of the day and it's like a hundred degrees already out here at nine in the morning, so that's enough talking. Let's get in there. Okay, so some first impression thoughts. This room is way bigger than I expected, so that's pretty cool. Uh, has anyone actually vlogged here, like any of the other vloggers? Because I've somehow never seen it and had no idea it was this cool. It is a little bit cramped with the eight-handed glass thing, but no big deal. And lastly, I'm still sitting in a 1-3 because there's no 2-5 yet. So hopefully that opens up soon because I can't stay too long today. But yeah, that's it for now. All right, so we are underway here at the Orleans playing some 1-3 No Limit Hold'em. One thing you'll notice is the buy-in is relatively deep considering that it's a $3 big blind, something I thought was pretty cool and worth noting. Anyway, in this first hand, there's a $10 open from a player in middle position. Then the player on my right makes the call before I look down at Jack-10 of spades. With a hand like Jack-10 suited, I think it could go either way between a raise and just a flat call. This time I decide to raise it and gain initiative in the hand. I make it $45. The original raiser folds, but the caller in the field makes the call. So not exactly the result I was anticipating, but it's fine nonetheless because we'll have position for the rest of the hand and two very playable cards. So when the flop comes down, jack, six, deuce, all hearts, and he checks it to me, I'm happy to put in a continuation bet here with top pair. Lots of hands to get value from, but no need to go too big just yet in a three bet pot. So I make it $40 and my opponent makes the call. Turn card looks great. It's a 10 of clubs, which shouldn't change too much actually, aside from us, I guess now beating hands like king jack or ace jack, but Aside from that, it seems like a perfectly good card to continue barreling on. However, I don't get that option because my opponent decides to just jam all in for $80. I think he had left at this point. No brainer call here, especially for that price. Not going to be folding top two, even with three of the same suit on the table. So I quickly make the call. Unfortunately, the river is the eight of hearts. So now our two pair is very unlikely to be the best hand. And indeed, that's what happens this time because my opponent flips over ace queen with the queen of hearts. So he picks up a gut shot to a straight on the turn along with uh, his queen high flush draw. Decides to just go with it and it works out this time. A little bit later on, this same player puts on the $6 straddle, and I look down at Ace-King from under the gun, or I guess under the gun one, whatever you want to call it when the straddle's on. You guys know what I mean. Anyway, I'm going to raise it up, obviously, with a very strong holding such as Ace-King. $20 to go. The button, small blind, and straddler all make the call. So we have an $80 pot going to a four-way flop of Ace-10-7 with two diamonds. 
So when the action checks to me with plenty of worse hands to get some value from, I'll definitely be looking to pump some money into this pot. So I make it $40, just half pot, and only the button makes the call. Turn card is not the best. It's the four of diamonds bringing in the front door flush. However, it's pretty difficult to make a flush, and I think my opponent in most cases here is gonna have just a top pair type holding, such as ace queen, ace jack, maybe even some small suited aces. So although we'll sometimes be behind when continuing to bet here, I think there's plenty of hands to still get some value from. Really any hand with a diamond is gonna continue here. So I put in another bet to the tune of $60, and once again, my opponent makes the call. He could certainly be trapping and lying in the weeds, but most of the time we'll still be ahead here. So just hoping for a clean river, which unfortunately is not the case. It's the nine of diamonds completing four to a flush on the table. So my hand is definitely not good for another value bet here. And I don't think it's weak enough to necessarily have to bluff with either. So I decided to just check it and see what my opponent does. He checks it right back and announces ace jack. So a pretty unfortunate run out because typically when two players hit top pair, that's a good opportunity to get a lot of value. But due to the nature of the board, it kind of prevented me from getting to do that. Oh well, still happy to take it down. At this point, they announced that the 2-5 game is opening. So I rack these chips up and move on over. I buy into the 2.5 for $1,200 and quickly get involved in a hand where there's a middle position open to $20 and the action folds to me in the small blind looking down at ace three of spades. I decide to come in for a re-raise to $80 and my opponent makes the call. So we're gonna go heads up to a flop here of king queen nine with two clubs. Not a whole lot going for us aside from a very obvious range advantage with the king and queen out there. A ton of hands that I re-raised pre-flop will be smashing this board, so I'll definitely be continuing even though I have just ace high. So I put in a bet of $60 and my opponent makes the call. The turn card is somewhat neutral. It's the nine of clubs pairing the board but bringing in the flush. I don't think it's necessarily a scary card and definitely one that I'll still be continuing on, probably just giving up on the river if we get called for a second time. I'm going to size up a little bit here and apply maximum pressure to hands like ace queen or queen jack, pocket jacks that decide to call a small bet on the flop. All these somewhat marginal holdings that my opponent will hold in this situation. So I make it $225, and after thinking for a few seconds, my opponent lets it go. Very nice. In the next one, there's an under-the-gun limp, and the next player makes it $20. Action folds to me in the big blind, and I look down at two red kings. So I'm definitely going to be coming in for a raise. If ace-three qualifies, these cards certainly do as well. $80 to go. The limper gets out of the way, but the original razor makes the call. Heads up here to a flop of queen seven six with two spades. My opponent in this case, I'd noticed, tends to bet a lot when check to, and anytime he senses weakness, he had been like somewhat piling money into the middle. So I decide to do something a little bit unorthodox and check it. I think this hand should mostly be bet in this situation, but it's fine to sometimes check over pairs. And it seems to sort of get the job done because my opponent puts out a bet of $105. Not gonna do anything but continue with a call here, so that's what I do. And we see an interesting turn card in the Queen of Hearts. Not gonna do anything but check it, of course, although it is a slightly concerning card because he will have top pair once he bets the flop sometimes. Anyway, I feel much better about my own hand when my opponent checks it back. So we're going to go to a river card here, which is the four of diamonds. Should change pretty much nothing. And it's a question between coming out and betting or checking and hoping my opponent puts in a bet. However, because my opponent checked back the turn, I got the idea that he has a showdown driven hand. I feel like a lot of bluffs would just continue on this turn card. But hands like pocket tens or pocket jacks would just try to get to showdown. So 
Because I think my opponent has these hands and I've heavily underrepped my own, I decided to put in a very sizable bet and try to make it look like a bluff such as ace king or ace jack suited or hands of that nature. So when I put out $325 and he thinks for a very long time, I'm happy with my sizing here because that's sort of what I wanted it to accomplish. It seems like a pretty difficult fold to make here with a pocket pair, but unfortunately that's what my opponent ends up doing. Obviously, I'm not sure if that's what he had. He certainly could have been thinking this long with maybe Ace King himself, but like I said, happy with the play, just didn't get too much value at the end. In the next hand, there's a limp from middle position, and I look down at King 10 from late position. I decide it's good enough to isolate this limper with. I make it $30 and get called by just the limper. So we're going to go heads up in position here to a flop of Queen 7-7. Seven, seven. This is a pretty dry flop that's often going to favor me a bit more than him. And there's so many turn cards that will give me equity. So he checks it, and I put in a bet of $35 and my opponent makes the call. It's a king on the turn, and I think this is where I make a mistake because with a lot of my bluffs, I'd definitely be using this card to continue to apply pressure, so I feel like I should be doing the same when I actually have it, but this time I decide to get sneaky and check it back. The river comes off the queen of hearts, and he leads into us for a $140 bet, the size of the pot and this is not exactly a fun situation whatsoever but it is one that seems pretty easy to figure out obviously this bet is just representing a bluff after we check back the turn he decides to just put in a bluff with whatever he floated the flop with or it's a very obvious full house with a hand like queen 10 or queen 9 maybe even queen jack that some people decide to limp in with. You guys know how it is. When it's a close decision, my chips are going in the middle and this time's no different. Unfortunately, it is the incorrect decision this time as my opponent flips over Queen Jack. Nice hand, sir. Later on, the action folds to me on the button and I look down at 7-4 of spades. I raise it to $15 and get called by both of the blinds. The flop comes down 10-3 deuce with one spade. When the action checks to me, I think you can go either way here between checking and betting. I decide to just check it back. Turn card is pretty sweet. It's the ace of spades. So we turn quite a bit of equity as well as a perceived range advantage since we will have some ace highs that play the flop this same way. So when the action checks to me, I put in a bet of $20. The small blind makes the call, and then the big blind raises to $80, almost as if he knew I was going to bet this card. This is definitely an underbluffed spot from the big blind, especially when, like I said, I can have a lot of top pairs here like ace-king and ace-queen. So I'm taking that fully into account as I decide to make the call and draw to either a straight or a flush. I feel like both of those hands would be fairly hidden. And with stacks being pretty deep against the big blind, there's plenty of implied odds if I hit my hand. So I make the call and pray that the small blind doesn't go all in because he's got like $200. So if he decides to just say, screw it, I'm going with it, that reopens the action to the big blind who can then raise again and force out all my equity. Luckily enough, the small blind decides to play it nice and just make the call, so looking for some help, and that's exactly what comes in the eight of spades. So we go runner, runner, flush in a pretty sizable pot, and we're gonna have position here. So hoping that some more money goes into the middle, but sadly, the action checks all the way to me, so it looks like I'm gonna have to do my own bidding. I proceed with a bet of $250. The small blind decides to shrug and call, for I think it was 230. However, the big blind does get away from it, claiming that he had two pairs. So pretty well played by him, I suppose. Anyway, I show it down and the small blind indeed cannot be a flush. So we take down a nice sized pot here in this 2-5 game. In the next hand, the first player to act limps in and the action folds to me in the small blind looking down at two tens. I raise it up to $25 and get called just by the limper. So heads up, out of position to a flop of ace nine deuce. 
I think you can go either way here between betting small or checking. The benefits to checking, obviously, is you pot control with a decent hand. On the other hand, though, there's some negative implications to checking here, which would be losing on the turn to hands that check back the flop, such as King Jack or Queen Jack, King Queen, all these Broadway cards that are going to leave us in somewhat of a strange position. So I decide to bet small here and my opponent makes the call. So not really sure where we stand in the hand. He could certainly be calling with worse hands against such small sizing. So when the turn comes a five of diamonds bringing in a flush draw, I decide to go into pot control mode and check it. My opponent puts in a bet of $55. And I think this is close because even though there's an ace out there, how many strong aces is he really going to have after limping in pre-flop? Ace king, ace queen, even ace jack all seem pretty unlikely. So he could just be betting like a weak ace, but he could also just be betting a bunch of hands that we still beat like a nine or a flush draw or who knows. These people do a lot of random things in these two five games. So I'm not done with it just yet. I decide to make the call and see what happens on the river. I suspect my opponent will check back a lot if he has an ace. So I feel like we'll get to showdown after calling here. The river is the eight of diamonds and I check it to him once again and he puts in another bet which in and of itself I thought was fairly interesting because like I said I suspect all aces to check back this river and especially so when the flush comes in. So really what's he representing here when he puts in a bet? I'm not really sure. It seems really bluffy and strange. What I don't like about it though is that he only bets $100 and that sizing looks very, very value heavy to me. So I'm in a little bit of a nasty spot here as I tend to get myself into. Long story short, I think you guys know where this is heading. I often make mistakes in poker hands and you could just add this one to the list because my opponent shows pocket aces after I make the call. I gotta say, I never saw pocket aces coming so Props to my opponent for playing it in a very sneaky fashion. In the last hand we'll go over today is certainly not the most exciting thing you'll ever hear, but I've been getting a lot of comments about posting hands that aren't huge, massive pots where I win or lose a bunch of money because these are realistically what a session is mostly made up of. So here it goes. A late position player opens to $15 and I look down at pocket nines on the button. I decide to raise it up to $50. This hand could go either as a call or a raise, but against this opponent, I'm very happy to play re-raise pots in position. So this time that's what I choose to do. Unfortunately, we see a four bet from the small blind to $140. The original raiser folds and we have a decision on our hand. Being somewhat at the bottom of a three betting range makes me want to fold, but being in position with deep stacks against someone who has a very narrow range makes me want to call. On top of that, the price is pretty good. He didn't even make it three times my raise. So I decided to make the call and see if we can flop a set or something of this sort. However, that's not what happens when the flop comes down 10, eight deuce rainbow. Why couldn't that pesky 10 just be one card lower? My opponent bets $275, so a whole pot-sized bet, and that is an exact example of why a call pre-flop seems fine to me. If you flop a set against an overpair, there's plenty of people who are happy to just mash all their chips in the pot as fast as they can, and thus making set mining very, very profitable against these opponents. However, that's not the case this time, and my opponent flips over pocket kings. You get away with it this time, sir. Anyway, after playing for around three or four hours, it was time to rack up and head back towards California.
Well, that concludes the trip, you guys. I'm pretty beat after three days of grinding, so looking forward to driving back into California right now. As far as today went, I ended up actually losing a little bit despite not really losing any giant hands. There's quite a bit of like, you know, calling raises and missing flops or three betting and having to give up. Little insignificant pots that aren't really vlog worthy, but certainly add up over the course of a few hours. So when it's all said and done, I lost a little bit, but no complaints because I actually really enjoyed this poker room. For anyone who hasn't tried it, if you're in the mood to try an off strip property, highly recommended. Uh, but that's it for this time, guys. Thanks as always for watching. And if you saw the last two vlogs, thanks for being a part of this little Vegas vacation journey I've been on. I hope you guys enjoyed the content as much as I enjoyed making it. And if you haven't already hit subscribe, because there's quite a few more vlogs lined up for the near future. Anyway, as always, thank you guys for all the support. Thank you for giving this video a thumbs up if you did. Really appreciate that. And I'll see you all next time. Peace.